it is really important for advocates of nonviolence to have a good understanding of violence and uh, where it comes from. In uh, my field of psychology, uh, violence uh, has not been highlighted to the extent that I think it should be. In the early decades of psychology, we had instinct theories of violence that really just uh, uh, didn't explain very much. Uh, instinct was a label, uh, and uh, the instinct was supposed to be aggression. We heard the word aggression a lot. And even in psychology textbooks today, if you look up in the index, you'll see uh, several page references for the word aggression, but not many references for uh, the word violence. It's kind of puzzling. But anyway, uh, there, after the instinct theories of violence uh, from people like uh, Freud and Conrad Lorenz and others, uh, there were there was a behavioristic theory uh, based on the idea of frustration. Frustration seemed to be easy to operationalize in the laboratory. Um, but even frustration doesn't really capture what the cause of violence is. Um, there is a theory, though, that I think comes much closer to the mark. And I find it very useful because it has a natural relationship to nonviolence. Um, the theory of violence that I'm speaking of is Gilligan's shame theory. And I'd like to describe the basic ideas of it in this video. Um, as I sometimes do, I'm going to share my screen. Cross my fingers. Um, theories usually are proposals about cause and effect. And in Gilligan's theory, um, the proposed cause of violence is shame. Uh, he goes so far as to say that shame is like a germ that causes the disease of violence. And where that idea came from was uh, through many interviews with uh, inmates in Massachusetts prisons. Uh, Gilligan, James Gilligan, was the chief psychiatrist for the Massachusetts prison system for a number of years. And he, as a psychiatrist, he was very interested in why these violent criminals had done the things that they did. And through many interviews, he decided that there was a common denominator in a lot of the life stories that he heard from violent criminals. Uh, there was a past history of abuse and bullying and humiliation and diminishment at the hands of others. Uh, in other words, there was a sense of shame. Uh, shame is Gilligan's preferred term for covering these feelings of uh, very low self-worth. And uh, it appeared from the interviews also that these people, these, these violent criminals craved respect, that they had their self-respect and the respect that they saw coming from others was so little and uh, in many cases uh, so disrespectful that they had no way of trying to make a statement about it except by resorting to violence. Um, so um, Gilligan proposed generalizing this theory from the prison population to incidents of violence in general. And if you start thinking of examples of violence, the kind of unnecessary violence that we want to get rid of, it very often fits this theory quite well. So here's the core of the theory. It's the idea that shame is the cause of violence. But when we start playing with that idea and trying to apply it to examples that we know, it gets elaborated because 
shame comes from somewhere and uh, violence either occurs or doesn't occur or is more or less intense. And <clears throat> to fill the theory out, we need a little more of a diagram than this. So here's a suggestion uh, based on Gilligan's work and also on observations that I've made uh, working with adjudicated youth. Um, uh, here's the principal idea in the theory that shame is the cause of violence. But a lot of us feel ashamed once in a while. You know, we uh, perhaps have been made to feel that we didn't we didn't do a good job in a presentation, we get criticized and we get knocked down and we feel bad about that. We often feel shame without resorting to violence. And, and why is that? Well, there are a number of barriers that prevent shame from leading to violence, depending on the case that we're talking about. One barrier very often is guilt, that we feel if uh, if we acted out violently, we would feel guilty about that. Um, another is our socialization, the way we were brought up, and uh, especially with respect to gender, because the the big elephant in the room in the study of violence is that most violence is committed by men and not by women. So the the fact that one has been socialized to be perhaps more circumspect and more gentle in their way of dealing with things, uh, perhaps because of being a woman or because of having a kind of personality where those traits are emphasized, uh, that might be a barrier uh, in this diagram. If, um, if the person who feels ashamed loves the potential target of their violence, that may hold them back and probably does in many instances. But as we know from studies of domestic violence, it, that isn't often enough. If uh, a person has alternative skills to use, for example, the skills that might come from going through uh, an anger management workshop or a nonviolence training, then the feeling of shame instead of impelling the person to action right away, might be seen as a signal that they have to kick in a skill that they know to prevent themselves from acting out in a way that they don't want. And then finally, um, there is, I've called it chaos, but sometimes a person who has been humiliated and disrespected also has a lot of other things going on in their life their life may be so disorganized that they are incapable of uh, targeted violence. And that's another set of problems, but in, in particular instances, it might be the thing that holds people back. So uh, shame comes initially from abuse and bullying, disrespect, humiliation, ostracism. There are a number of words we can use to capture that feeling of being put down by others, by being shamed, shamed by others. And um, uh, here's, the, here's the thing that's wrong with our current system of punishing uh, violent criminals. <clears throat> the violence that those men, usually men, commit is punished uh, by sending them to prison we're essentially retaliating against the person for their violence by inflicting another kind of violence on them. And to them, that's perceived as more abuse. So what does that do? <clears throat> it basically keeps the sense that I'm being shamed alive or strengthens it. And that is just uh, the red arrows indicate a vicious circle in which um, uh, disrespect and violence and disrespect and violence repeat in a cycle of retaliation. The person who feels the shame may also think about it a lot and engage in self-talk with themselves 
about how bad they feel because they feel ashamed. In a, in a sense, in essence, they um, they're ashamed of being ashamed. It's one of those recursive uh, loops that we can represent with a curved arrow uh, in this diagram. But the rumination, the thinking that we do about our own shame, only intensifies the shame. It doesn't help it to go away. Um, now there's another path, and this is a way of illustrating uh, where we could go to reform our prison system, and also where we could go in our own behavior to break cycles of violence in everyday life on a smaller scale. I'm calling it restorative justice, and that is a thing. Uh, there are excellent treatments of restorative justice um, compilations of readings and so on. Um, and uh, restorative justice means responding to the violence with a consequence that is more humane, that recognizes that, that this person who was violent probably feels terrible uh, because of this background, these causes of shame. But um, instead of sending them to a prison where, uh, or a juvenile facility where the kids may just play cards all day, uh, or uh, an adult prison where uh, there are additional sources of abuse and disrespect that just magnify the punishment that the person has been given. Um, restorative justice is exemplified, I think, by the, the school that I'm, I'm on the board of. It's uh, Silver Oak Academy, and uh, it's, it's a high school and also a residential treatment center for young men. Um, and what we do there is provide uh, education, athletics, uh, vocational training, uh, and sort of applied nonviolence as a way of operating the school. And we see many successes coming from that. And it's because when you begin to respect a person, when you give them some guidance and uh, you let them experience respectful treatment, um, often within a relatively short time, that reduces their feelings of shame and gives them some feelings of respect that, that damp down and then end this cycle. I've put a little minus sign here to indicate that what this respectful treatment does is not cause more shame, but reduce shame and uh, eliminate. So uh, that's um, that's a run through of Gilligan's theory as I understand it. And uh, this is the most relatable theory I think I've ever taught to uh, students, especially to students at Silver Oak Academy who come from uh, very often from inner city neighborhoods that are very rough and very, uh, very violent. But they see this as a way of understanding what they mean by being dissed. And dissed is short for being disrespected. They understand that disrespect is the reason why they engage in violence because being disrespected is just intolerable. Um, and um, the, uh, the theory just, it, it immediately rings true to uh, many students and uh, to many people really, if they try to take the theory and try to test it out by applying it to examples that they know. So um, the way Gilligan's theory relates to nonviolence, I think is uh, most easily seen if we contrast disrespect with respect. And in uh, nonviolence, we sometimes use this word agape, which means uh, goodwill toward others. And if we can maintain goodwill, in our dealings with others, even when they are very unlikable, <laughs> and even when they've done things that we abhor, our future relations, our ongoing relations with them are likely to offer more options that are constructive. 
And very often, as we see at Silver Oak Academy, the uh, uh, it, after a time, a, a light bulb goes on <laughs> and uh, a person changes their opinion of what their options are and what they can do with their lives. And um, I think teaching this theory uh, and finding a way to teach it at age appropriate levels to all students <clears throat> would be a really excellent idea. It also complements uh, the nonviolence ideas that we get from Martin Luther King and from Gandhi, and, because they're emphasizing that we should deal with uh, our opponents as people and respectfully and with conciliation rather than aggression. Um, then who knows what will happen? But we're opening a door rather than closing a door and we're breaking a cycle of violence rather than keeping it going. So Gilligan's, uh, he's provided us with some, I think, very good ideas, very much worth thinking about. If you have found this interesting, please uh, subscribe to the channel, Learning Nonviolence. Uh, please give the video a like if you like it, and I'll see you very shortly.